Hola, I am Javier Romero and in this video we are going to see the section on variables of the introduction part of our tutorial on easy answer set programming. So let's see here this logic program that has variables and coming from what we have seen before this looks a bit different so actually what happens is that the syntax that these programs have is a bit different to what we have seen before. So then let's have a closer look at it and see what is in there. First, we have this number one here, that is a constant. And a constant can be, and we will see later more example of this, a number or it can be a word like computer science, Monday in this timetabling example or in seminar planning, or it can be just cat or the name of a person like, I don't know, Magic Johnson, Michael Stipe, whatever. And these are used to refer to a specific object in general. This is the way we, we, the term we use in mathematics to refer to anything in general, just an object. And in natural language, we would say that these are things that we use to refer to things or to beings. Oh. Good. And then this rule here, which as we will see later, we call a fact, can be read as follows we must add n of 1 to every answer set, right? Or n of 1 must belong to every answer set, right? It must belong to every answer set because there's no condition here. Good, so then this, with this one, we can refer to a specific object, in this case, a number, and with other constant, we can refer to a specific things or bins. Now, if we want to refer to things in general, then we have to use variables like this x that appears in all these positions, right? And this is used to refer to every possible object. So then this choice rule, for example, we can read it as follows. For every x or for every object x, but we can just make it simpler and say for every x, if n of x belongs to the set, then we may choose to add a of x or a of x may also belong to the set, right? And here, for every x, if a of x belongs to the set, then b of x must belong also to the set. Or if a of x belongs to the set, then we must add b of x to the set. Or going the other way around, for every x, we must add b of x to the set if a of x is in the set, right? Read it this like an if in this direction. I'm not sure. I think when I do the videos, I should do the other direction because the camera changes it. Well, whatever, I think you get what I mean. And then with this last choice rule, we can read it as follows. For every x, it cannot be the case that n of x belongs to a set and b of x does not belong to the set or eliminate the set, so sorry, for every x, eliminate a set if n of x belongs to the set, but b of x does not belong to the set. Good, then, um, then we have the terms, and a term is either a constant or a variable. And basically, these are terms are the things are the elements of the program that are used to refer to objects, things, or beings. And if we refer to them in a specific way, then we use constants. And if we refer to them in general, then we use variables. And actually here, there's just this X, but variables in general are represented by words that they start with uppercase. Good, then we will see more of this later. Then here we have these predicates like n, a, b. Yes, and these are all we have, these predicates, these three predicates. But actually being a bit more precise, uh, I have to say that these are just the predicate names, n, a, and b. Because a predicate consists of the name plus its arity, and the arity is the number of arguments that it has. And here, all of them have just one argument because there's only one term inside these parentheses. But here we could suppose that instead of having n of one, we have n of one comma two. Then n 
then there would be a predicate n with two arguments. We would say a predicate n with arity 2 that would be different to predicate n with arity 1. Right? Okay, so let me say it again straight. A predicate has a name and an arity, and the arity is the number of arguments that it has. Now, in practice, what will happen is that normally in, the, in most of the programs, we will never have a predicate with some, a predicate name with some arguments and a predicate name with another number of arguments. So then we often will be talking about predicates, just calling them by their, by their name without taking into account this arity. But I think it's good to know in case this shows up at some point. Good, then here we have the atoms. This is similar to before, but now we have the name of the predicate here, the parenthesis, and then here we may have a, a list of terms separated by commas. In this case, there's just one term, so there are no commas, but we will see them later. And yeah, this is a bit similar, different to what was what we had before, where the atoms were just the letters or the words, but whenever the, but in this syntax generalized what we had before, because whenever we have zero arguments, then we can either, suppose that we have this n with zero arguments, either we could eliminate the one or also eliminate the parenthesis and then we just had n and nothing else, right? So this is to say the syntax generalized what we had before because the atoms that we had before can be represented here with zero arguments. I hope this is clear. Now these are the atoms and literals as before are atoms or their negation. And then this is more or less same story as what we had before. All of these are rules. Then this is a fact. So a fact is a normal rule that has no body. And then again, a choice rule, a normal rule, and a constraint rule. And these are the heads on the left of the if symbol or, well, here there's no if symbol, but we could also write it here and, in, and it would work also. So these are the heads and, oops, sorry, I went back. These are the heads and these are the bodies, right? So then we have that a fact is a normal rule without body and a constraint. You can see it as a normal rule without a head or also as a choice rule, right? Given that we don't have a head, it doesn't matter how we consider it. What matters is that a constraint has no head, okay? And all of them, a set of them is a program. Let's see now what are the answer sets of this logic program with variables. And for this, we do as before. Initially, we know nothing. There's nothing in the set. So then we have to apply some rule. And if you, we look here, the only rule that we can apply is this first fact, because all the others depend on n or on a that has not been applied yet, or this constraint also depends on the n. So we just can apply this, and it's telling us add n of 1 to the answer set, no matter what. Then this is what we do. We apply it, we add n of 1 to the answer set. Then, okay, let's see here. Then after we have applied the rule for n, we can apply this choice rule. And still, this we cannot apply because in the body we have A, and here A is in the head, and we have not applied yet. And similarly, with respect to the constraint and the B that occurs in this rule that we have not applied yet, right? So then we must apply this constraint, and this is telling us for every X, if F, if N of X is in the set, then we may add A of X to the set, right? Then here, the condition for every x holds when x is 1, right? So it says for every x, if n of x belongs to the set, so in this case it holds when x is 1, so then we may add a of 1 to the set, right? And this is what we do. So on this side, we keep the set that we had, and here we add a of 1 because we may do it. And another way of reading this is thinking that first we say it in a general way for every x, if n of x is in the set, then we may add a of x. And since this is in general, specifically, 
this is also for the case where x is 1 so this is also telling us that if n of 1 is in the set then we may add a, a of 1 and this is actually what we are doing since n of 1 is in the set we are adding a of 1 and since this is for every x is it is also talking about any possible uh, object that we could have here in place of this x but for those that are different than 1 since n of those objects does not belong to our set then simply we don't care about it right so then this is what we get up to this point now we have applied these two rules and I think it should be clear that we can only apply this one because this depends on the B that we have to, that is the head of this rule. Then when we apply it, this is telling us for every X, if A of X is in an answer set, then B of X must be in the answer set. Then <clears throat> this if condition holds for this set when X has the value one, right? This is telling us that in general for every x, if a of x we must put b of x, and in particular that if a of one is in the set, then b of one must be in the set. So here we have a of one, so then we must add b of one. And if we look at this model, there is no x such that a of x belongs to the set, right? Then nothing happened after applying this rule, the set remains the same, right? Or again, just repeating a bit what I've said, this tells us that in general for every x, if a of x is in the set, b of x must be in the set. So it is also telling us that for, for 1, 2, 3, 11, 100, for cat, for yellow, for computer science, a of that, if a of that belongs to the set, B of that belongs to the set. But here we have no A, so then nothing happens when we apply the rule for all these possible objects, right? Good, and then we can only apply the constraint. This is only the, the only rule left to be applied. And this is telling us that for every X, it cannot be the case that N of X belongs to the set, but B of X does not belong to the set. And here it turns out that when X is x is 1, n of 1 belongs to the set, but b of 1 does not belong to the set. Then we eliminate this model, this, uh, sorry, this set, this does not survive, and yes, this is what happens on this side. On this side, for x, when x is 1, we have n of 1, but we have also b of 1, so then the body does not hold the constraint is not violated, then this set is not eliminated because we have n of 1, but it is not the case that b of 1 is not in the set because indeed it is in the set. And then we are left with this set with n1, a1, b1. And actually what we have done is we have applied the rules of the program in order. And then the result that we obtain are the answer sets of this program. Hence, we know that N1, A1, and B1 is the unique answer set of this program. And this was about the understanding of the program. Now, methodologically, we are going to write the rules in order as here, and then we know that the answer sets are just the result of applying the rules as they are written because they are written in order. Let's see this running now with Klingo, and for this, I'm here at this Upython notebook of the tutorial that as before you can reach simply clicking on the link that I put below on the description of the video. So here we have, this is about variables, this is our example, this is just what we had in the slides. So we run the cell either with control, enter or here with run. And then we tell Klingo rather to give us all the answer sets and then it, un it tells us that, well, it's version 5.4.0, it's reading from this example 3 that we have just read, and it finds an answer that has N1, B1, and A1, and here it says that it, there's just one model, which is another way to call these answers here, and since there's no plus here, then this means that there's one model, and this is 
everything that there is. So there's, this tells us that the logic program has a unique answer set and here we know it's n1, b1, a1, which is exactly what we had here. Now, as we did before, we can see that we can, if we comment this rule and then we run this, then we obtain also the set n1 and this is exactly what we had here, right? So if we, the, the result of applying these three rules corresponds to the answer sets of this program, right? That are n1 and the other that we had. And this is exactly what we obtain here. When we comment this rule, we are left with these three and we get these two answer sets, which is what we were computing here. And now, if we consider the program that it only has these two rules, these are the two answer sets, n1 and n1, a1. And this is what we get if we also comment this rule. Remember this percentage symbol comments whatever appears to its right. I think now I did it in the right direction. Hopefully, then I'll check it. Okay, then we write it and we run, and as before, n1 and n1, a1. And if we comment everything, we just will have n1, and this is what appears here, and this is what we had there also, right? That the program that only contains a1 has the unique stable model n1. Okay, good. So now let's leave this as it was. And uh, let's extend a little bit the example because here we were just considering predicates of RIT1, predicates with one argument. So let's do something still very simple, but now with, with this n having two arguments, we say n of one comma two holds, and for every x, y, if n of x, y is in the set, then we may choose to add a of x, y. And then here, for every a of x, y, sorry, for every x, y, if a of x, y belongs to the set, then b of x must belong to the set. Oops, sorry. And then the constraint that tells us that for every x, y, it cannot be the case that n of x, y belongs to the set and b of x does not belong to the set, okay? So now let's see, let's go in this case, let's simulate here the construction of the tree of the of this graph that we are building in the in the slides. So and here I I am using this magic cell command so that I can just write the program here. And I'm telling again read from the cell. This is what this minus is doing here, and with zero I tell the system give me all answer sets as you all know by now. Then with n12, we of course just get n of 1, 2. Now, if we also have this rule, first we will apply n of 1, 2 and we will get the fact n of 1, 2. And then this rule will allow us to choose to add a of 1, 2 to the set, right? Because the body only holds when x is 1 and y is 2. So then we can choose for a of 1, comma, and then this will give us two answers, right? Where here nothing is added, but here we add a of one, two. And now if we do this, then this rule is part of the program. So we can apply it after, and we can apply it after applying this one. So it tells us that for every x, y, if a of x, y is in the set, b of x is in the set. So here there's no x, y such that a of x, y, x, y belongs to the set, so we are going to keep the same answer set after adding this rule, but here we will extend this, right? I think it's clear by now with b1, because for x1 and y2, the body holds, and then the rule applies and gives us a of, sorry, b of 1, and this is what will happen when we run it, that b of 1 appears there, right? And then just if we also apply the constraint, it tells us it cannot be the case that, so for every x and y, it cannot be the case that n of x, y belongs to the set, but b of x does not belong to the set. And here we have that for x, when x is one and y is two, n of x, y 
is in the set, so n of 1, 2 is in the set, but b of x or b of 1 is not in the set. So then this tells us then eliminate that answer set, and then this will be eliminated. And here, when x is 1 and y is 2, n of x, y, so n, 1, 2, is in the set, but b of 1 is indeed in the set. So then this condition doesn't hold, right? This is telling us if b of x, which in this case where x is 1, so if b of 1 is not in the set, then delete the answer set, but it is the case that b of 1 is in the set, so nothing happens and this will survive. So all we are going to do is to delete this one, and this is exactly what happens, right? n12, a12, and then db1, and as you see, now when I call Klingo again, suddenly this b1 appears here in second position, but as um, I think it was already made clear in some previous video, it doesn't matter the order in which Klingo prints the atom. This is just a set. That's it. Good. And I think that's it for this first example on logic program with variables. I hope you enjoyed it and see you in the next video. Stay tuned. Ciao.